Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines on New Central TV. I'm Darshan Usman. Now, Breakfast Headlines begins in West Africa, where civil society organizations in northern Nigeria have written to President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, stating that the withdrawal of Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso in the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, poses a big security threat. In the letter they jointly signed, the CSO said the withdrawal of Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso poses a direct threat to the collaborative efforts required to combat regional security challenges. Let's also tell you that the governor of Zamfara State in Nigeria's northwest, Doda Lawaldere, has inaugurated a 2,600 strong vigilante force to combat violent criminal gangs terrorizing the region. Zamfara State is one of the several states plagued by criminal known or criminals known as bandits who raid and loot villages, kill residents and burn houses to the ground. The gangs maintain camps in a huge forest straddling Zamfara, Katana, Kaduna and Niger, and Niger states, I beg your pardon, and have carried out mass kidnappings of students from schools in recent years. Now to a business-related story, the Nigerian Naira has rebounded as commercial banks responded to the Central Bank of Nigeria's 24-hour directive by offloading dollars into the official market. The foreign exchange market is experiencing a relief in pressure evident in the increased volume of dollar transactions. The daily turnover in the foreign exchange market surged by an impressive 85.36% reaching $134.07 million on Wednesday, compared to $72.33 million recorded the previous day. In a related development, but this time in the northern part of the continent, Egypt's economic crisis is squeezing high street brands as experts seek or ask how the Arab world's most populous nation will repay its soaring debts amidst a severe foreign currency crunch, the US dollar has become hard to come by as the Egyptian pound is plunging and inflation is surging at 35%. Now in Mali, the UN rights chief said Thursday that he was appalled by alleged summary executions of 25 people by Mali's army and foreign military personnel last week in a region plagued by militant insurgency. Volker Turk also expressed alarm at the killing of around 30 others in attacks at the weekend in central Mali, a particular hotbed of violence. In southern Africa, where Zimbabwe opposition politician and government critic Job Sikala has shared his feelings on being released. The politician, who was freed this week after more than a year and a half in prison, narrated how tough it was in prison and spoke of his desire to find out why he was punished. When I first arrived, some of my children cried. It was unbelievable. It was an unbelievable story to me. Because this is the father whom they have not been with for the past uh, uh, period of nearly two years. I need to rest. You have to understand that I was living in solitary confinement, a very difficult situation, in a two and a half meters by one meter cell. It was not an easy situation where I was sleeping on the floor, on the floor, with the chains on, on, on chains. It was not a difficult. It was not an easy 
experience it. I'm trying to get the truth of the motive of my persecution. I, I need an answer on that. Because it's still up to now. I don't know why. I don't know why these people have done this to me. Even my emotions are very, very near. Because these people have done this difficult situation for me. Now up north, Moroccan police have arrested 30 people suspected of involvement in the child trafficking ring targeting newborn babies. The first national police, in collaboration with Morocco's Territory Surveillance Services, said those arrested include 18 security officers, a doctor, two nurses, healthcare professionals and intermediaries. Preliminary investigation findings reveal that some of those arrested are accused of functioning as intermediaries in the selling of newborn babies, collaborating with single mothers for financial benefit and arranging adoptions for families seeking children. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's now back to Osauge and Joe. Thank you very much, Dashan. Um, as always, interesting stories once again. Um, the, of course, uh, Naira dollar exchange rate, you know, has to be the biggest conversation in Nigeria today because of how much it's affecting, you know, every single aspect of our, of our economy. And, of course, you know, with Nigerians um, and their expenses. Um, I'm hoping that the CBN, you know, knows what it's doing and is able to make the right moves. Luckily, we're going to be having someone join us today to have uh, these conversations. Absolutely. And, and also, um, quite shocking to also note that um, Egypt, which happens to be one of the most uh, thriving economies in Africa, is also going through the dollar crunch and also going through economic hardships uh, mm -hmm. and hardship dashing. Your thoughts? Uh, yeah, every, everyone is actually affected. Like, uh, especially in Africa, we're really, really affected by uh, the exchange rate. And I, I did speak to uh, an economist yesterday who said that... Uh, uh, CBN telling the deposit money banks to actually dump uh, the dollars into the official market is just a transitory move. It's not uh, long term, it's actually short term. So what happens once, you know, all the dollar is gone and, you know, uh, are we back to square one or do we come up with something else, more policies that will help out? So it's just short term. It's a lot of conversation, though. Uh, one would wonder what's taken an actor so long uh, to, uh, for Africa to feel its impact and uh, the conversations on Africa having one single, um, you know, um, exchange rates, better still, or currency, so all Africans can trade. But then again, when will these things take place? How long? We're still so dependent on the dollar and the like. That, that would take a while, you know, mm -hmm. but I, I think, you know, you know, there's many other reasons that that may not even work eventually. We've seen the AFC, FTA, I think, you know, and how much, you know, that was meant to help trade um, between countries here on, on continent. But it doesn't seem to have done much. We've also seen, you know, how generally even tourism between countries here on the continent is difficult, it's expensive, makes absolutely no sense. So. We, we have, you know, internal issues here on the continent, mm. you know, and I don't think a singular currency might be, you know, should be our focus now. There's many other things that would have helped trade and, the, and you know, an economic relationship between countries here on the continent that we've not done yet. There is that part. And then I think aside also looking at what we can do across the continent, let's focus on what we can do at home. How do we increase crude oil production? How do we, you know, make our, our country more productive? and reduce, you know, the dependency on the dollar? How do we, you know, start to produce something? Anything whatsoever, even if it is... Slippers. I was going to say ma mommy water, but... <laughs> any, just anything, you know, that, you know, Nigerian can offer to the rest of the world that increases um, our um, the level of production and, of course, our income. Mm -hmm. There has to be something. That, those are the things that we should be really thinking about to give the Naira more value somehow, some way. Um, there's no way that the Nigerian government can not in any way, shape, or form increase our crude oil production and earn more foreign currency. I don't know. But we'll see. <sighs> we'll see. Tough times. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Dashin, thank for joining thank us. We'll you see you guys. again at 9 a.m. All right. Thank you so much. Have All a fun right. show. Take care of yourself. Okay. So we're still here on Breakfast Central, and we've got a whole lot. Let's quickly tell you that you can be part of the program. Uh, we're going to run through um, some of the biggest stories, and we'll also share with you the phone numbers.
Uh, so you can take it down right now on the screen and get ready to join us later on when we'll be uh, reviewing the front pages of the papers. The conversations are indeed uh, deep and we look forward to share them with you, plus bringing the experts to also have the multiple discussions. Absolutely. Remember to also tweet at New Central TV and uh, share your thoughts with us. We'll be um, eager to share your thoughts on our um, on screen, you know, during the program. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we continue. Welcome again to Breakfast Central. The worrisome climate of insecurity in the country seems not to be ending soon. This time, suspected bandits uh, yesterday kidnapped a director at the Federal Housing Authority, FHA Federal Capital Territory, Mr. Aundo Ver. The kidnapper struck a few days after the FCT minister, Yes, when we read the riot act for criminals in the area. Now, according to a source, the incident happened at Pambara New Extension, Bwari Central Area of the FCT, which is about uh, 200 meters from the military camp and checkpoint in Bwari. Well, the hoodlums um, were said to have gained access to the victim through the fence after cutting the barbed wires, while all attempts by the vigilantes in the area to rescue the victim proved abortive due to lack of sophisticated weapons. Um, the incident comes on the heels of the kidnap of five school children, three teachers and a bus driver in Emuri Kiti, Kiti State on Monday, January 29. And by Tuesday, the kidnappers had issued a demand of 100 million for the release of their victims. And currently, as we also speak to you, um, Kwara State is not left out. There's also been uh, kidnap and also um, information reaching that there's a reported attempt or killing of a monarch, his wife being abducted, and two others in Kwara State. Governor Abdul Rahman Abdul Razak has indeed spoken, describing the incident as one that um, uh, uh, cannot be ascertained with security experts and operatives um, combing the bushes uh, where this incident took, play, uh, took place uh, to ensure that they can um, quickly find uh, the abductees. Very, very sad situation that Nigeria is indeed going through kidnapping from left right and center Saudi. Yeah. and i saw uh, uh, an interview yesterday on another uh, media organization uh, the police uh, force uh, spokesperson i think uh, lumu um was being interviewed and he said you know that kidnapping is not on the rise you know you know on on um, like what people are saying that it's not on the rise you know mm -hmm. it's you know that it's maybe just being heightened by the media so I'm not sure whether he means that this is a normal level and we should not, you know, feel be, al be alarmed or anything that this one that is happening, you know, where Just families, you know, kids, you know, monarchs and the likes have been taken, it's not on the rise. It's, this is a normal, you know, level, you know, so don't don't be acting like you're, you know, it's on the rise and anybody should be bothered. Um, wow. it's, in, it's very interesting. But of course, you know, the president is still in France. And uh, we, of course, are going to be getting into other conversations this morning to see whether maybe he could have done better in the last eight months uh, to, of course, you know, reduce the level of kidnapping that we're currently dealing with. Um, Nigeria's President Bala Tinubu has, of course, vehemently opposed the unjust portrayal of all Nigerians as universally corrupt. Uh, the President commended the efforts of the EFCC for its role as a moral guide and condemned uh, the unfair labeling of Nigerians as corrupt based on a few actions. The President also pledged strong government support to the EFCC against cyber crimes while announcing uh, the Students' Loan Board uh, to empower youth, encouraging legal pursuits and dispelling stereotypes for national prosperity. Well, you would also recall that immediately President Bola Metunubu took office. The administration had implemented crucial reforms like floating the Naira and cutting fuel subsidies. Despite rising living costs, the federal government calls on Nigerians to exercise patience assuring that the president and the team are working diligently for long-term successes. Well, the big question is, how much time does the president need? Let's now bring in political analyst Katch Anonuju, who joins us here. He's at DG Heritage Centre, Abuja. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see you. Thank you very much for having me, as always. Fine. Uh, uh, right before we go ahead and um, take a look at the statements made by the president and the likes, um, what have you made of the recent uh, spate of kidnappings that we hear daily? Now, just a few hours ago, um, it was um, Kwara State. Right before that, it's just where you are, Abuja, the federal capital territory, which is supposed to be known to be highly secured, uh, highly protected. Uh, what's your take? My take is simple. It's not surprising. The increase in insecurity was expected. 
because with the Fulani war across West Africa finally betting in Nigeria, and the Nigerian authorities not actually uh, prepared to do anything, or should I say, uh, seem to be very dysfunctional, and a lot of them who act, act as if they were already compromised. I believe this we prepared for. This didn't just happen. It's been going on for the past 12 years. It was in Central African Republic. It was in Mali. It was in Burkina Faso. It's now in Nigeria. We should simply get our lawyers and understand the Fulani war in West Africa has betted in Nigeria. Don't pretend it doesn't exist. Don't pretend you were no one before. Now we've still seen the effect of the security cooperation between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. It's now forcing a lot of the militia men to run into Nigeria. That means we need to be prepared to do something. That's why I tell people, now is the time for state police. There is no need to prevaricate. We have to allow the governors, organized local state police, to protect the indigenous people of their state. There is no need awaiting for the federal police structure. The federal security structure has been compromised by President Buhari, has now been seen to be dysfunctional. So if the state cannot protect us, we have the right to organize to protect ourselves. It is no more time for rhetoric. I think that time has passed. The times for your question have passed. Now that that war is in Nigeria, Nigeria, you can see in the past one week, you've seen movements in Zamfara. You've seen in a lot of states trying to organize their own internal militias. If the federal government, as I'm seeing, are purposely being ineffective, the people should wake up and seek ways to protect themselves. We can no more rely on Tinibu since he said that he will continue from where Buhari continued. So if Buhari continued to be very ineffectual against the security crisis across the Sahel, and now that it's in Nigeria, Nigerians must find a way to protect themselves. There is no need making questions or wondering why, how we got here. We know how we got here. It was by behaving as if trees don't have leaves. No, they do have leaves. Now that the leaves are beginning to fall down in this particular autumn and spring, we should understand it is time now for us to ask collective individuals, sit within our immediate communities, and notice those who are not amongst us, organize our people. Now is the time for state police. It's not yesterday. It is today. So we start it now. And if there is no state police, I advise people to organize their community policies to be able to protect themselves. There is a war on. Don't be asking questions anymore. This is the time for action. All right, Mr. Um, you know, like you've mentioned, uh, everybody uh, should be aware of where, you know, why, you know, things are currently the way they are with regard to security and where we're coming from. So, you know, because, you know, of the picture that you've painted, would it be fair to say that we're coming from a you know, really dark place, you know, with the previous administration and maybe even prior to the previous administration. And so it's maybe a little unfair to expect the current um, administration to, you know, perform magic in just eight months. Would that, you know, be a fair statement to make? Well, you will understand that eight months is enough for anybody to sit down and plan. And don't forget, prior to him being sworn in, he would have been advised. So if the security agencies didn't advise him about the crisis in the Sahel that's been ravaging across of countries in the West Africa, then that means he wasn't properly prepared. If he was prepared about the crisis in West Africa and the likelihood of his betting in Nigeria, and he didn't do anything in eight months, then of course, we will be very correct to blame him. But I can tell you right now, there is no way Tinubu will say he didn't know that there was a Fulani war across West Africa. All of us knew it. I kept saying it. The APC government were looking for ways to intimidate uh, stations 
to stop me from coming to tell the truth. I will go make a program and they will find the program station of five million. All those were strategies by agents of these people who are inside the state apparatus to undermine our access to information. Now that they have failed with the court case that say they have no right to punish television stations for allowing truth to be aired, Nigerians should take that as an opportunity to speak up, speak out, and speak truth to power. We cannot stay and be killed. Only a tree stands for it to be cut down. We are human beings. As far as our eyes can honestly see and our brains can process, we know now the Fulani war across West Africa has finally bettered in Nigeria. And the right thing to do for us is if we still see that President Tinubu is actually purposely ineffective or he's inept in protecting lives and property, then we should go on to protect ourselves. And that's what you see in state. You saw uh, Zampara in the past 48 hours, they launched their security outfit. You saw a lot of other places. You'll see the kidnapping of uh, uh, traditional rulers. Don't forget, we were warned about this by my late friend, uh, 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 Obadiah, that died. He said that the time will come when the cells will be activated into this kind of thing. Now, the kidnapping is as, 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 as a consequence of their need to also gain operational funding to do what they are doing. That's why they are doing the kidnapping, to gain money to fund the slow motion war. It has come to Nigeria. Let's not joke about it. If the federal government doesn't do anything to collectively protect the citizens, citizens might be forced to do things on their own in a way that could balkanize this country and may even cost us Nigeria. I believe this is the time for President Buha Tinibu to show that he is not, as he said earlier, continuing from where Buhari continued, to be ineffective, to close his eyes to honest incidences of security challenges, we will not accept that. There is a war on. Accept it. The war has come to Nigeria. We should try to cooperate with Niger, Burkina Faso, and Mali, whose joint security operations seems to be pushing these militias into Nigeria. Let Tidibu tell them if they run away from Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger running to Nigeria, that the Nigerian government would not allow them to have a safe heaven where they can hide. You could see it. Some of the militia men who came in were gathered into a unit and launched in Nasarawa State last week by my brother and friend, Bello Abdullahi Bodecho. And that is the same thing that the ESN was accused of doing, launching an ethnic militia. Why should the federal government keep quiet when an ethnic militia has been launched in Latvia, when they declared the ESN a terrorist organization and proscribed it? And then because of that, Buharina launched his staged unknown government sting operation, which I am happy for President Tinubu to have stopped as he ended the funding, that was why you saw it was through home for Christmas in historical numbers. I believe, let him also extend that thing he has done for the Igbos to the rest of the country. Since he has stopped the funding of the unknown government could brought it to an end, let him also stop the support subtly of the militias across Nigeria. Let Nigerians know we can trust him, Tinibu, be effective. Don't be afraid of anybody. If you don't protect us, we will take measures to protect ourselves. And who knows, those measures Nigerians will take to protect themselves could actually lead to the end of Nigeria. I don't yeah. think that's the best thing. That's why I yeah. believe the government should set purpose right now towards providing security of life and properties across Nigeria. You cannot pretend it's not here. The militia, as you see, are mostly not Nigerians. They don't speak English. They don't speak Hausa, they speak Bambara and French. And we must set purpose towards eradicating them from Nigerian soil. All right, Mr. Mr. Nonoji, uh, but there, 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 there are facts and there are worries that the uh, Nigerian police force, for instance, uh, doesn't have enough of uh, security personnel. Um, re recently, they had 
uh, called for a drafting of um, new police officers into the force. And there's also concern that um, the army is indeed um, overstretched, where they have to fight um, insurgency in the north, they have to go to the east, they have to go to different places, they are underpaid and so on. So the president is dealing with quite a lot. I'm trying to look at it from his perspective, and I'd like you to um, try this morning to fit into his shoes. Maybe let's just wear his shoes for, for, for a few minutes while we're here. Um, these situations are there, looking at him strangely in the face, and then you have the new um, corps, the new uh, commanders, and so on, in the military, of course, in the Navy and the like. But what do you think the president can actually really do in this situation? Um, looking at these challenges that are indeed being, uh, that he's facing, that he needs to be confronted with and needs to find a solution with. You have just, as you speak, parroted a fraudulent rhetoric being bandied about by those who are actually on the side of these terrorists. There is nothing like military uh, as threat. Somebody was telling me two days ago, uh, and we also need to uh, arrange new budgeting. Uh, it is not true. The military were under instructions by Buh uh, Buhari to stay hands. That's why they didn't do anything when the military jet was shot down by terrorists in Zampara. That's why they did nothing when soldiers were kidnapped from the Joint Defense Academy and some killed. That's why they didn't do anything when the Kaduna Abuja train was bombed and the people kidnapped. What would they have taken to just locate and take them out? An ordinary uh, 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 area photography helped by drones. The drones, if you had taken them to where we know them to stay, at Dogongona. Dogongona is a massive forest. And it's actually a forest reserve at the back of Pandogari, at the back of Alawa at the back of Brinimwali, which also could be assessed on the Kaduna Abuja Road. They kept quiet. You heard what Asari Dokobo said, that because of the loss of confidence in Buhari's ways with the army, he was hired and him and his troops to do some of these security things. Buhari actually compromised the country's security to an extent where you do not trust anybody. Remember, we are now seeing a lot of the terrorists actually being put into the police. You saw the radicalized Boko Haram people being put into Lagos State as Lagos State indigenous of Nigerian army. You saw that. So this is not a time to ask questions. Don't tell me stories of there is no finances, the army is overstretched. Those are rhetoric. If you are a soldier, you swear your oath to the Constitution not your oath to the politician. And that's where we got it wrong. When Buratai started looking to Buhari's works, instead of acting through the efforts of military intelligence to stop the ethnic cleansings in Kaduna, ethnic cleansings in Benue, ethnic cleansings in Plateau that is still going on. It is not a joke. I said it years ago. These things are driven by a need for land. Buhari asked the country for land through eight years, he asked for grazing reserve, he asked for calf colony, he asked for Ruga, he asked for grazing route, he asked for consolidation of underground or surface water. All that he wanted to gain land to resettle the Fulani refugees escaping from wars in Mali, Central African Republic, in Burkina Faso, and other places. Not to have them settled. Don't forget, we had this problem in 1974 when Israel invaded its Lebanon. When the Lebanese came here, we quartered them in Kano, Apapa, and other places as refugees. Buhari didn't do that. Buhari was using fraudulent schemes to try to gain land across Nigeria to resettle Fulani refugees. It failed. Now those refugees have now massed themselves wherever they want. Now they are kidnapping to fund their operations. There is a war on. The earlier you wake up to it, the better. Don't start taking those rhetorics that have been bandied about by very, very criminally minded people, the army is uh, uh, insufficient, the army is overstretched, the police is not there. Why would you give police to protect private individuals when the security of society is not yet secured? How can you do that? You're telling me army is threat. 
Why are they being paid salary? What are they doing? They are not stretched. These are just rhetorics being promoted to actually undermine our resolve to react to these security challenges right. in aid of saving Nigeria. Right, now, Andrew. it will be wrong if every community starts to organize their own army. So before that happens, I advise for the quick establishment of state police across. You can... Yeah, well, Mr. Nonju, hmm. I don't know how likely that would be, you know, with the current National Assembly. You know, I don't even know if it's part of the conversations that they're having, you know, uh, with the government. Um, but I want us, you know, to quickly move away from security. You know, it's been eight months of other things, not just um, uh, kidnapping. Um, so, I mean, let's get your analysis also, you know, on how the government has handled other aspects of our, uh, of our country, you know, with the economy. Uh, mostly the economy, of course, which has been, you know, the biggest talking point lately. Um, would you also, you know, cut them some slack, you know, that they're also finding their footing? Um, there's still a lot to understand, you know, and of course there's a global economic meltdown, so it's not just in Nigeria. Um, aside security, have they all, have, is there anything that they've also been able to handle well enough or, you know, that you can see that, okay, we're moving in the right direction um, in the last eight months? I can tell you the security services are good. They are good when they are allowed to do their job. Listen, Nigeria has good security people. Nigeria have honest citizens and patriots who want to really be good in security. The problem we have is that of leadership. It was Buhari that, according to some people, who had used his body language to force the security people to stay in hands. If Buhari had allowed the army and the police and the other security services to act, we would have been able to arrest those who, in open field, kept Nigerians. They were kidnapped from the train going from Abuja to Kaduna. We know where they are. Erufai said that. We know where they are. We know how to get them back. The government at the top lacks the security will. They lack the political will to allow security services to do their job. So, just like you're telling me now, in eight months, ask me, isn't eight months enough for Tidibu to have sat down and then organize and say, look, don't take this nonsense. Root them out. Today that we have drones, drones uh, into Mr. the Nanadu. bushes, we locate where these people are and we take them out. Uh, it is when we do not have the political will to do the right thing. Yeah, Mr. Nanadu, you kindly hold on. Yeah, I, I, apologies for jumping in. I just wanted, you know, I want us to also cover other, other aspects of governance. Um, aside okay. security. We, we, we've spoken about security and I think we get a clear picture of how well they've done all field. Um, so, I'm, you know, I want us to, you know, to also look at, you know, the economy, which is another major talking point. You know, and then I was asking, is there any, any other part of governance that they have been seemingly successful at in the last eight months? Is there anything that maybe shows you that, yes, they understand where they are going um, so far? Um, and so, you know, we can rate them, you know, maybe 50 percent aside, you know, the security challenges. I like Tidibu's attempt to subtly start the, the polite devolution of over-concentration of national assets in Abuja. I believe that those devolution of those assets to the federal regions is inclusive of the thoughts behind devolutions under restructuring. I support it 100%, so that is a good policy. I also do support Tinibu's attempt to actually stop the unknown government thing operation being arranged by the Buhari administration that I praise him for stopping the funding of the unknown government in the East. But I now want him to also do for the middle belt and a lot of the north the same thing he has done for the East. Those are Nigerians being killed. We shouldn't keep quiet for this to happen. I pray President Tinubu finds the political will to save Northern Nigeria. I believe he has done well in those areas, but I believe he should do more. The rhetoric about moving funds to Lagos and Central Bank to Lagos, I agree with it for two things. If Lagos has the ability to become the financial hub in West Africa, don't undermine it. If Lagos has the opportunity to become 
a major aviation hub in West Africa, allow it to grow into that. And that's why I support those instructions about the festing of the over-concentration of national assets in Abuja to the places where they will provide maximum benefits for not only Nigerians, but also for the government. I think it should go on to announce that everything about oil should move to Niger Delta. That way he will not find support from the people in the Niger Delta. Let him also take Minister of Agriculture to places like Taraba or Benue State, and then take water resources to as far north as the border areas where you have water problems. So there are a lot of things to do. When you announce Lagos alone, people start attacking you. But when you announce it everywhere, and people now see how they can gain, people will start supporting you. I want him to do that. And I want him to do that very quickly. Some of these things cannot be done when you listen to corrupt politicians who will not be happy that their children who work in central bank will not be forced with their husbands that also work there to relocate to Lagos. Those things don't mean nothing. Tinubu should go on and sustain his attempt at devolution of the over-concentration of assets in the center to the federating regions. I support that, and I tell you now openly, I am with it, but I pray he goes on to also make announcements about things like taking the oil businesses to Niger Delta, taking things like uh, 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 mining to the places where we have the best advantages, taking things as Obasanjo did about post authority to where the waters are in Lagos. Let's start that quickly. Water resources should move to the far north. They need water. So you all agriculture should go to the middle belt. That those are where you have the food basket. Things like, uh, uh, look, we have several of it to do. And that is where I will tell you he has done well. I commend him. But I want him to do it in a, an honest form where people can look and Nigerians will join him to campaign that others who want to have a concentration at the center should just go and sit down. Well, we've gotten your point, although um, a lot of persons will disagree, especially looking at the fact that um, if you uh, move uh, the CBN to Lagos, uh, FAN, um, other states would be underdeveloped. And of course, there's also the conversation of federal character and the likes, uh, just as the Arawa. Uh, anyway, you know what? We can continue this conversation and time uh, will fail us if we stick to this. I want to say thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you for taking time out to join us. Political analyst and DG Heritage Center, Abuja Katch. I don't need you. Thank you for having me, as always. I'm happy to be with you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so the conversation continues. And uh, like we said, you can be part of it. And look forward to the 8 o'clock hour where we'll talk incisively about uh, what the front pages are saying. But um, we just finished one very heated conversation that's sparking a lot of uh, controversies online, and most importantly from uh, different... Uh, a uh, uh, mouth quote of Nigerians where they're saying, hey, uh, the situation of things in Nigeria is very difficult. How much more of uh, what will happen in the next few weeks to come? But then again, we're going to do conversation. We'll go for a quick break. When we come back, we're taking a look at one of the biggest action uh, packed uh, game games that will be taking uh, place later today and would establish a connection with our man who is live in Abidjan. Stay with us. Nigeria will today, Friday, the 2nd, February 2024, at the Felix um, Hufer Bogni Stadium in Abidjan, face Old Foes Angola as they continue their quest for their fourth African Cup of Nations title, which they last won in 2013. Now, after emerging as the top ranked country following the exit of some of the continent's uh, big guns, the Super Eagles are now the favorites to win the 34th edition of uh, the AFCON in Ivory Coast. Well, we've got our eyes and ears, and of course, this morning, we look forward to be joined by Favor Itua. Hopefully, um, the network is indeed favorable. But in the meantime, Nigeria's uh, coach, uh, talk about the Super Eagles coach, uh, Jose Pizero, uh, spoke in, uh, just yesterday uh, during the press briefing, and he also uh, talked about the possibilities and what to expect today. We believe in our team, but one match, one quarters, is our second final. We played the first final in the, before. The second final, we want to play the third final and the fourth final. 
But for me, this match, specific match, only one match, 50% for each one. You can no, mention it, some favorite. For me tomorrow, you go there, start 0-0. Zero, zero. You want to score? You want to suffer goals, considered goals? Only that. Now I want to take a uh, go to take the final decision. You go to do the test, last test. But if you cannot play, play Francis. For me, I am, conf I am confident. I have confidence in them. Get to Angola because obviously to get to where we are in this stage of the competition, it's, it's a big, big achievement in itself. And like I said, the game before where they were able to score four goals, it's not easy and they have a lot of creative players. But like um, the coach said, I trust my team. We've been keeping clean sheets. We've only suffered one goal, so hopefully that plays a factor as well. But we're going we're gonna to need the whole team again to defend. Um, we're going to have to fight for the team, fight for the, for the win. It's not going to be easy, like they've been scoring a lot of goals, but I have confidence in my team that we'll be able to withstand any pressure that they put on us. You don't really need much from me when you have creative players up front, whether it's um, Victor, Samuel Chukweze, Vic, uh, Adamola Lutman, Simon Moses. There's a lot of creativity going up front. So the role me and Frank have been told to do is to control the game as much as we can, but first and foremost, defend as a team. So whether it's me creating or not, there's always going to be a lot of other quality players that can do the job. So. I'm trying to do my job for the team, and like I said, anything to help the team win, that's what I'm... Oh, well, there you have it. Alex Iwobi and Jose Pacerio, uh, both uh, speaking about the Nigerian game against Angola. Um, Favor, um, good morning. Uh, thanks for, of course, uh, creating some time for us uh, on Breakfast Central. Is it, you know, wrong to say that they don't sound very con um, confident? about completely obliterating Angola today? Or will I just be asking for too much? Well, uh, good morning, Osauge. I think for me, it's a, it's a part of the Super Eagles trying to respect the team, not uh, knowing fully well that uh, in the last few weeks, we've got to see, gotten to see upsets. Uh, we've gotten to see how teams have been bonded out of the competition. So instead of you know, coming out and sounding so, so super confident, it's just for the Super Eagles to just play down on a lot of things and then come out with the results. Because, of course, Angola, they are not a small team at all. They scored six goals in the group stage, but uh, considered three goals. And then in the round of they scored three goals without conceding. So they are, they are good in scoring goals. And for the Super Eagles of Nigeria, they scored lesser number of goals, but considered also lesser number of goals. That's talking about one goal in the competition. So they have a very good defense going into this game. So for the Angola side, I think for the Super Eagles, they just want to just keep everything, you know, minimal, try to play down on everything about talking about the team is uh, currently the favorite to win the title. I think these are just many things they're just trying to manage at the moment. But then, one thing is certain, the field would definitely suffer when the two sides come together to play later today. All right, Favor. Um, some, somewhat of good news, if I put it that way. Uh, where uh, Coach uh, Pissero says, um, well, Stanley Wabali, yeah, could feature uh, for the Super Eagles today, but if he can't, then Francis will be the go-to man. I mean, not for respect to Francis, he's been there behind the sticks for the uh, Super Eagles, but it seems there's, uh, there's a lot of confidence when it has to do with um, Wabali, um, you know, mounting uh, the goalposts for Nigeria. Um, is there an affirmative or a confirmation that um, Stanley will actually be there. We did see stories circulating that, yes, he's going to be there for Nigeria. But, of course, you did hear what the coach said, that, uh, you know, there's a possibility neither here nor there. Um, your take, um, is there any confirmation? everything each of the goalkeepers did in training, the likes of Ojo, Lon, Leke, Francis Uzo. I, for myself, I did uh, you know, reach out to him to say, Stanley Wabali, how are you doing? Are you good? He said, yes, he's very good and fine. He was even able to dive to get the balls. That's to show you that he doesn't have any sign of the injury. And from what we saw yesterday in the training session, 
it's looking 90% sure that Stanley Wabadi will be behind the sticks against uh, Angola. So we would expect to see that happen. I mean, he has recovered so, so quickly, and um, Nigerians also, aside from Nigerians, the players in the Super Eagles camp are also excited because, of course, he has given them confidence going forward to attack, considering what has happened in the last few years with Francis Uzor. But nevertheless, should he have any issue today, Francis Uzor will be called upon. But I can tell you categorically from what I saw yesterday, except something happens overnight, if he got, if he got injured, you know, maybe while eating or while waking up from sleep, there's no reason he shouldn't start today against Angola. Okay. Well, hopefully, you know, he doesn't have any issues while eating or waking up from sleep. Um, we'd like to see him in goal. But I think, you know, everyone should also have confidence in Francis Uzo. Whoever it is that shows up in, in goal today, um, you know, we should support them as much as possible. <laughs> we should support them as much as possible. And, of course, you know, chair, chair the Super goes on to victory. Uh, thank you very much, Favor. And um, we'll talk, definitely be sticking with you much later today, all right? All right. Well, um, that's it uh, for now in sports. We've had a very interesting hour here. Uh, we've, you know, spoken a little bit about, you know, security challenges. We've had, of course, Dachin Usman join us for news. And, of course, Kash on Nonu Joy, beg your pardon, join us to share his thoughts on the last eight months of the Bolamet Tinubu presidency. But, you know, we have a lot more coming your way in the second half. So let's share with you what comes up next in the second half of Breakfast Central. All right, so um, we're welcoming you back to uh, Breakfast Central here on News Central, our very first paper this morning. But let's also inform you that you can call in. Uh, the numbers will be shown there on the screen. So go ahead and start dialing uh, to indeed react. And let's know what your take simply is on the front pages as we will be breaking it down uh, from bits to pieces, most importantly. And hopefully our guest um, is able to make it through. So uh, just like you saw earlier, our very first paper is what we're taking a look at. And the front page of that newspaper known as This Nigeria says, Dollar Crisis, BDC Operators Fight, CBN Over Cost, Withdraw Services, Close Offices in Abuja, Lagos, Kano, Bank Customers Decry Increase in Hardship, Reduce Purchasing Power, Petrol Price May Rise Soon, says Lokwo Biri, <laughs> 610 that's pretty too small. They're saying, get ready, prices might go up by an extra, extra cost, which might see it uh, go get into 700, 750. Or better still, you might just want to read the story for yourself and find out what the possibilities are. Mm. Anyway, uh, let's take a look at another one. Bandits demand a 290 million naira noodles drugs to release seven Kuduru hostages. So bandits are indeed um, demanding for money. They're demanding for food, they're demanding for drugs. And I saw this post yesterday where um, a medical uh, practitioner, a professional, a doctor, and also a nurse, uh, they mentioned that um, it seems like the bandits are also aiming to kidnap uh, medical practitioners. So um, she did mention that one of her friends, who's a nurse, was just released after four months. Mm. And even her kidnap was not made into the news. Remember that we did say, oh, yeah, we always there's, say... There's definitely hundreds of, yeah. um, you know... Uh, out of every one. Stories, yeah. Yeah, out of every one kidnap, yeah. or th there are many more. Uh, she said her friend was, was just released, that she was kept uh, for four months in the bush. What was her job? She was taking care of the victims. Mm. And that was what she was doing. Oh, yeah. She was taking care of the victims so they could keep them uh, going uh, until the money comes. Um, some also commented under that post and said, well, we condemn the entire practice, but... If you would keep the victims alive until monies are eventually paid for them to be released, then that's fair. As regards healing them, yeah. healing them, and then still collecting monies, which seems to be very, uh, a very heinous act. Anyway, Senate seeks robust partnership collaboration with Germany on security electricity. I thought this was already done. The president has said that he spoke uh, when the prime, uh, the German um, prime minister came to Nigeria. They did talk about this, so what are they seeking for another robust? We've had multiple of these bilateral, you know, meetings and relations. You know, I remember the Siemens deal mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, in Boris' administration. Uh, there's also been something, you know, that came up, you know, late into the administration or early in, in, in this administration. Um, you know, we're just hoping that it trans, you know, late into, you know, generating 30,000 megawatts um, of electricity at some point. 
I've seen, um, I, th I think Tolu Gunlesi posted that a project has been completed in, um, in Niger State, I believe, a, a new, you know, dam project has just been completed. So, you know, whichever, you know, partnerships that they need to get into, that's fine, you know, as long as it translates into more electricity generated for Nigeria and for Nigerian businesses. Mm. Well, good luck to them. Quite, quite sad. Anyway, there's another one there, uh, a big one. <laughs> Alleged 109 billion naira fraud, ex AGF Idris objects to EFCC's video evidence. So, this story is one story we're going to keep a lookout or keep an eye on because we expect it to grow and we expect EFCC to do the needful. Hopefully, they will. Um, Ondo Chief Judge swears in Adelami as Deputy Governor. There will be no peace for criminals in FCT, Wiki declares. And um, uh, minutes after he declared, guess what? They kidnapped. Uh, Federal um, um, you know, uh, housing director immediately, yeah. uh, indirectly, they called the bluff to his, um, his rants or his statements. Uh, Wiki went ahead to flag of rural road projects in Gwangwala. I can see him in the picture there saying that in order for security to be curbed, there must be good roads so they can actually uh, chase the perpetrators. But then again, the perpetrators are using the bushes. So you're going to also clear the bushes. Uh, what are the methods you plan to use? But then again, that's all that we have on the front page of this Nigeria. Don't forget, we should um, we have the, uh, the numbers again on the screen. You can react to either of these stories, um, either the case of fraud, um, the PDC operators fighting, uh, CBN over cost, or WK declaring um, no hideouts for criminals, and much more. Yeah, um, in, in reaction to the story, I mean, first of all, yes, WK is the minister of the FCT. He's not necessarily in control or in full control of the you know, security agencies. You know, he pretty much has the same powers or even less, you know, of the powers, you know, that, that compared to what governors have in their respective states. And governors have always complained that they don't have any control over the security for, um, you know, agency. So um, if he is boasting, you know, or at least bragging about how much they would fix security, I'm not sure what exactly he plans to do different from what he did while he was governor of River State or from what, you know, any other governor, you know, across Nigeria has, has been able to do. Um, but, you know, whichever, you know, tactic that they have, you know, it should be encouraged. I believe that it's all for the benefit of, the benefit of Nigerians. Um, the Mohamed Idris, you know, conversation is also very, very interesting. But, you know, I, I believe that these are things that you very likely would only hear of in Nigeria, that a person who's accused of 109 <laughs> billion naira fraud um, went on, you know, like he had no worries in life to, you know, get a chief dancer title late into 2023. Um, and of course, has continued to seemingly just live his life like you know, that, like he has zero worries. And of course, now he's objecting to the EFCC's video evidence. You know, there's ob obviously other details to the case that you know aren't shared in just that headline. But um, it shows for me, it shows the attitude that we have really towards the fight against corruption and how people also see or sense the fight against corruption. The fact that they don't see it as anything um, threatening. Um, Idris, Mohamed Idris doesn't necessarily feel, you know, like he has in any way, you know, he, he you know, he will be, he doesn't feel like he's likely to be sent to jail, basically. Um, but it's not, this is not saying that he's guilty, you know, he, of course, would have to go through the process. Um, but now imagine how long it is taking for a person who's accused of 109 billionaire fraud uh, to not immediately have had multiple um, 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 uh, court appearances um, and of course, will be some, you know, headway, you know, in the case, and just, you know, whether he's guilty or not. There is that one. Bandits demanding 290 million naira noodles, drugs to treat seven Kuduru hostages. Um, but this, once again, is another opportunity for us to say, or for me to say, that this is being done by a cartel. I don't think that this is, you know, simply just a bunch of rogue people who are hungry and need food to eat. This is not a situation where there's a lot of you know, the high level of unemployment, as you normally would have said it in the past. There's a high mm -hmm. level of unemployment in, in the FCT or in, across Nigeria, and so people are resorting to kidnapping. This is a situation where I think that there is a cartel or multiple cartels that have seen kidnapping as their source of funding whatever other crime that they're committing. Um, it could be, you know, bandits. It could be terrorist groups. It could be, you know, any other thing that may not even be, um, you know, just here in Nigeria. But these large sums of money are being used to fund something else, maybe to buy more ammunition, maybe to, you know, carry out some other, you know, um, 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 activity, you know, elsewhere here in Nigeria across the continent. 
if you look at the faces of the people who have been, the few times when they say that, you know, these kidnappers were caught or this person was arrested, these people do not look like, any, like, like they have seen a millionaire in their lives. They do not look like they have, you know, they, in their bank accounts, they have up to 200,000 naira. So these funds that are being, you know, you know, gotten from victims of kidnapping, hundreds of millions of naira, even billions of naira, if you do a proper analysis in the last couple of years, these funds are definitely not to feed some hungry family somewhere because the person is broke. It is being used to fund some other aspect of terrorism. Um, and this is my very, very, you know, ignorant analysis, but it's what I think. It's being used to fund some other type of terrorist activity, some other, you know, place here in Nigeria or across the continent, maybe in a different place entirely in the world. And if we do better with tracing the money, we may be able to find one person who is not, you know, you know, in the, in the bush with them, but is responsible for this, you know, level of kidnapping. The, the, the level of work that needs to be done is not just with the police, also with the DSS, with the NIA, with the Nigerian Army, and every other security agency put together. Um, but these things are almost clear. I don't know how we move from a situation where, maybe it's inflation. Kidnappers, you know, maybe in 1990 or in 2000 then would, you know, maybe up to 5 million. You know, I mean, that's the most that you hear, 5 million, you know, or, or, or 7 million. I don't but know. Now, 100 million. Now, we're talking about 100 million now, 200 million now, you know. And if you remember the, the train kidnapping, the Abuja uh, Kaduna train yeah. kidnapping, it was 100 million that were asking for victims. Then people were saying that they must have made more than a billion now with everybody who, you know, supposedly paid ransom paid, to leave. Yeah. These funds definitely aren't being used to pay children's school fees back at home or to pay rent. These are, you know, definitely being used to fund some other terrorist activity or the other. And so the work that needs to be done is a lot. Um, I wish the Nigerian security agencies the absolute best and I hope that they're able to figure these things out. Um, I hope that the Nigerian government also understands what's at stake. Um, I think those are the two big stories, you know, that I thought to be to quickly uh, speak about. Remember, you can join us this morning. Uh, call the numbers on your screen. Uh, be a part of the conversation and uh, share your thoughts with us. Right? Be our guest this morning. Share your thoughts with us on these stories. And um, um, uh, we, of course, we would love to hear from you. You can also tweet at us this morning at uh, New Central TV and let us know your thoughts on these stories. Let's move away from the this Nigerian newspaper, see what else we can find. On the Punch newspapers this morning, mm. abductions, 15 states enlist 50,000 vigilantes against kidnappers. Sokoto to train 2,000 men, Delta recruited 2,400, Ogun 16,500, says uh, governor's aides. Abductors threatening to kill Ekiti school children, reduce ransom to 15 million, says the parents. Mm. Mm. Also, the Punch Federal Government bars states from collecting mining royalties. Uh, Naira rebounds as banks offload excess dollars. Uh, we can also find uh, this morning, by elections, IG warns troublemakers restricts movement to 26 states. Uh, protests rock OAUTH over 2,000 sacked workers. Airfares to UK, US orders jump by 55%. Trust me, I am a victim. <laughs> 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 I am a victim. <laughs> Lagos Chinese uh, firm Seal Rail and Bridger Project deals. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, it's a much better train than what we currently have. You know, and maybe we can get a high-speed train in Lagos at some, uh, some point. Maybe we could also get, even if we don't, you don't get a high-speed train. Let's get 10, 50, you know, trains. Let's get more. You know, let's let's increase the number of people that the trains are able to carry. Let's reduce the dependency on the roads. Let's be able to move people from, you know, Shongu Tedu or, you know, Ekbe all the way down to you know, CMS or somewhere um, in Lagos um, in, in 30 minutes or in 25 minutes because we have, you know, working trains. Um, remember to join us. Let us know your thoughts, all right? If you have your own theories as to what is exactly might be going on with security and why the government might be failing to tackle these security challenges, remember to quickly call those numbers and let's uh, get your thoughts. The Naira rebounds as bank of loads excess dollars is also something that we will be expanding a little bit more on. Uh, to see exactly if the CBN might, of course, have made the right move. How long will this right move last? Is the Naira eventually going to, you know, catch um, uh, um, uh, a breath and then now start hit hitting 1,600 again? I think as of yesterday was the evening, it was back to 1,450. 1,400, yeah. yeah. Uh, and a lot of people were not happy that it didn't change immediately when it was 1,500. Yeah, that's true. And it's likely to come down, but then again, economists have said, there's no guarantee that it would, you know, really come down to 800 like it was before. 
<laughs> but why are we even why are we even using eight hundred as the new? Do you know how badly how bad? beaten you have to be, yeah? <laughs> that you now say that at least give us eight hundred. Mm. This is a naira that was a hundred and twenty before, hundred and twenty five, hundred and fifteen. We've now been so badly beaten. Good morning, um, Ibrahim. What's your where are you calling from? Hello, good morning. Um, welcome, Ibrahim. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Clear. Sorry, my name is Greg. I'm calling you from Brooklyn State. Welcome. Go ahead. Yeah. I saw some of the headlines, and it just baffles me that the government of Nigeria today is completely clueless about what government is. We talked about the story of the government of President asking for five. Ibrahim, I think we, we get, you know, most of what um, yeah. your views are. You know, you, you think the government is clueless. Thank you very much for calling. Hopefully we um, get to hear from you again. But um, he, he did, you know, make, a, you know, a, a point. You know, the, the thing that I find troubling is, you know, when Nigerians say, oh, if you can't do the job, you know, step, step, step aside. aside. That, that is never going to happen. That has never happened. It's never going to happen, at least until, <laughs> and this is when it would start to happen until we actually see people who get into public office to serve. That's one. And then two, until we have a system where you can actually be impeached as president. It, listen, once you are president in Nigeria, the reality is you either have four years or you have eight years. <laughs> that, that's, that's the reality. Until we get to that point where you can actually be impeached, then you will sit up knowing that, okay, if people do not like you after six months, they can kick you out. Let, let, let's take another call. Uh, we do have Pastor Paul calling from Isola. Good morning, Pastor Paul. Yeah, good morning. How are you? We're fine, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I, I actually want, no, I want to talk about insecurity that is happening all over the country. And uh, I just want to let Nigerians know that they are expecting much from our leaders. They, they are expecting so much. There's really so much in a country that is not organized. Nigeria is not organized. Until Nigeria, all of us can sit down and discuss about unity of Nigeria, then we think about moving forward. But as far as the structure of Nigeria is like this, Tunubu cannot even do anything. No head of state can be there and do anything because there are secret agenda for this nation that people don't know. And that is what is playing out. You will see more terrorists. You will see more attacks. It's not going to stop. Not even military can stop it. Not even police. Because the structure of Nigeria is, has been broken. We don't even have a structure. We need to seek them. Ask ourselves, can we really want to be together? Do we really want to move on? How do we want to move on? Without that, insecurity will continue to happen. It's just unfortunate that people will be dying. 
And I pray that Yoruba elders will speak to Tunubu to restructure Nigeria and let us discuss whether we can stay together or not. Because nothing is working right. in this country. Thank you. All right, Pastor Paul, you know, also giving it, you know, brief there, talking about restructuring. It does have a point. There's uh, people who still have that, you know, as a major concern. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, there's so much, you know, to unpack, you know, and um, every government that comes into, you know, into power um, and claims that they were overwhelmed, you know, because there's so much yeah. to do, you know, it, it always doesn't make sense, you know, because I'm sure that you knew the challenges before you got there, before you campaigned. Anyway, let's share a little bit more of the newspapers this morning. The Daily Trust newspapers comes up next. Joe? All right, let's take a look at the Daily Trust this morning. Um, Nigerians decry rising cost of living. Um, that was also uh, our top story in the first hour. But I do um, appreciate the uh, infographics there. So let's take a look at it. Rise, 45,000 40, naira, now 70,000 naira. While I was having my monologue um, yesterday, I did mention that it was 64,000, 65,000. So take a look at this. It's now 70,000 naira, okay, on the front page there. Let's take a look at Flaw. Flaw, 35,000 naira, now 44,000 naira. So already, in some areas, the price of bread has gone up again. Yeah. It's, uh, it used to be <clears throat> 1, 1, 1, 2, now 1, 5, okay? I even saw, <laughs> it's, I, saw I, was, I was about buying slice of bread and I did see one they said oh it's 2,000 I said 2,000 why are you guys running ahead of the inflation and they started laughing they said see that's it that this one is made with fine flour it's not a Nigerian flour I'm like okay all right okay that's fine so for the 4,000 naira and by the way I didn't buy it so don't think I did I never did I did buy it I got my Agibwe and uh, I was doing well oh well <laughs> soaked my Agibwe in a nice uh, cup of tea and I was good to go anyway uh sugar 62,000 naira now 75,000 naira Cement, I thought Bua said his cement will come to 3.5. Yeah, yeah. Mm, never I happened. Don't know that 5,200 naira for cement, or anyway, it's now 7,000 naira. Hmm. Anyway, let's take a look at uh, some of the stories, other stories as well. Uh, don't forget you can react to the stories by calling the numbers. Uh, but let's take a look at another one. Ahead of Saturday's by election, Plateau PDP protest a mission on ballot. So PDP is having a big challenge in uh, Plateau State. Don't forget, uh, Tuang, uh, the governor has already said it's time to unseat um, some of the APC candidates. Uh, but it's not looking that way because there's a lot of protests ongoing now. There's an omission on, uh, of their names or better still logos and the likes on the ballot. So remember, this took place in 2023 in some of the elect, uh, election, um, during the presidential election as well, uh, where in some polling units you wouldn't find you know, certain face or certain logo and the likes. Nara Gains sells for $1,400 at Parallel Market. Uh, Niger Junta expels EU Recovery Mission members. Hmm. Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, and Guinea are indeed um, taking a, a lot of decisions uh, quite very, very strongly. Uh, Gaza, NSCIA acts ICJ to hold genocide against Palestinians. Ekiti abduction, our children left without food, beaten by captors. So sad. So sad. They must have abandoned them, their food flask and the lights went while they were kidnapped. Well, these are the big stories on the front page of uh, Daily Trust. Take a look at the rising cost of living in Nigeria. It is indeed a big problem. Um, one thing to worry about is the fact that the food prices are not coming down, Nigerians. The food prices are going up, and we do know the uh, remedy for this. The remedy simply is not going to come from us. It's going to come from those at the top on what to do. But then again, like you say, you also have a role to play. But then again, what role do you have to play when food prices have to go up? Uh, when you talk to those who are in the field of production, in the field of buying and selling, they tell you that when they go to buy these food items, the prices have gone up in transportation, transporting themselves back and forth coming back. Um, for those who sell, I do know a lady who sells um, frozen food. She stopped selling right now. She said no more because there's no power. I don't know what power is like in your area, but there's no power. And the recent one she said she had stocked, they all got spoiled. Oh, yeah. So money's gone. Yeah. And she said, you know what? I'll just stick to, you know, the um, uh, Look, uh, other type of food, yeah. possibly perishable and non-perishable yeah she's not the only one i mean she she would be affected you know maybe um 
uh, directly and um, also it would cause her, you know, massive losses. But she's not the only one who's suffering, um, you know, the effect of epileptic power supply on her business. Um, I'm, I'm also really worried as to what exactly happened that changed the price of rice between early January and late January from 45 to 70,000 naira. That's, that's a really, really high move because if you compare it with the other products that are there, flour moved from 35 to 44, sugar moved from 62 to 75. I think I have an answer to that question. Nigeria is a rice we love rice. Yeah, yes, it is. But I mean, we, we also do a lot of baking, you know, and so flour should have, everything should pretty much have the same, almost the same um, percentage increment. It's just shocking how, how, we, how it happened. And this is after a government came into, into power, closed Nigeria's borders, um, claimed, you know, that they were making uh, Nigeria rice sufficient and they were investing hundreds of billions of Naira. you know about the Naira. rice pyramid? Yes, the fake <laughs> rice pyramid. Um, they were investing hundreds of billions of Naira in improving agriculture. There was almost no, you know, move that wasn't made. You know, it was mostly propaganda that was not made by the previous administration in order to improve on Nigeria's rice production. All of it failed. Um, the borders were closed for many, many months to absolutely you know, almost no result or no positive result in Nigeria's economy and Nigeria's agricultural sector, you know, of production. Um, and it's, it, it's not completely knocking off, you know, the idea. They maybe had good plans for it, but it just didn't work. I don't know. But they also maybe weren't advised properly and they, they probably should have done, done better or done different. But these are the big stories on the Daily Trust newspapers this morning. Um, really sad story with the situation in AKT, with the AKT um, kidnap victims. I think we can squeeze in our final newspaper yes, this morning, sure, the Vanguard sure. newspaper, see what we can find over there. It says, uh, there after AKT, more children kidnapped in Benway. Um, also, write us to the story, says, armed herders kill 15 in um, Agatu. Bandits demand cough syrup, rice. 290 million naira to release seven hostages. Very interesting, actually. Um, abducted, they seem to be more caring these days. Abducted AKT Pupil's host, um, um, school's um, parents. Community launch crowdfunding for ransom. Police arrest eight suspects, urge residents to stay calm. Established state police to fight insecurity. PDP governors tell federal government. And also court jails actress six months for spraying and stepping on new naira notes. Uh, top of the screen there. Why government should remove electricity subsidy, says the power minister, like Nigerians haven't suffered enough. Like there's nothing that the Nigerian government understands that it, it's actually fine to subsidize this thing. You don't have to, you know, your, your very first move shouldn't be looking out for ways to make more money or to remove subsidies to save money or whatnot. There are certain things that countries across the world subsidize for their citizens, and it is fine. It helps business. There's even someone who would argue that petrol subsidy is not even necessarily a bad thing. Petrol or electricity subsidy. It helps businesses to survive, and it is your also your contribution to the business's growth. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think we have a call. Good morning. Morning, Comrade good morning. Alimisa from Niger State. No, from Yola, please. Oh, from Yola. Thanks for calling us all the way. How's Yola this morning? Uh, Yola is good. It's good. All right, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to intervene on the issue of uh, rice production in Nigeria. I came to Yola on transfer as a civil servant, and I realized that uh, the predominant occupation of everybody, whether single lady, everybody that I've met in this state, is farming, and majorly rice farming. And this cut across Gombe, another part of Northeast, and even being with state. So the rice revolution is for real. It's not, it's not a fallacy. The fact that middlemen are buying this talk and holding it to cause this kind of inflation you are seeing now is responsible for this. It's left for the government to put down measures to checkmate the activities of these middlemen and others. Rice production is what is sustaining many families in the Northeast. Many families. You will not believe it, what rice is doing to people in this state. I came, I saw, and I'm doing it now. So yeah. it's not a fallacy. It is for real. I yeah, no, 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 of course, no one is, no one says that there's no rice production. There's definitely rice production, you know, on, on a large scale in Nigeria. No doubt. Even in Ebony State, Yola is even far. Um, but what is the, what's the cost of a bag of rice in Yola? The cost of a bag of rice in Yola is about the same rate you are talking there. That's what I'm still saying. There has been a lot of hoarding out there. 
So it's still 70,000 naira for a bag of rice in Yola, even when, exactly. you know, the production is seemingly high yeah. over there. Yes, yes, it's unfortunate. It's very unfortunate. When we finish our, when the farmers, when the farmers, come again. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, when the farmers have best their product, the middlemen come out to buy this thing from me because they don't store them. Then they go and hold it. At times like this, this thing start going up. Fasting is a few months from now, and you will not believe it. These prices you are seeing now will be chai clay. Hmm. It's going. If it, even the period of fasting, you see Muslims like my like brothers like us going out there to high prices unnecessarily, even when they are cautioned in the mouth how to do that. So we are in trouble. Most of the problems we are having in this country is self-inflicted by ourselves. Our greed, our greed for money, and we don't have that culture to look out for the next person that is, that, is not, that is not having it. It's very pathetic. Yeah. We, we agree with you, Comrade right. Musa. It's very pathetic. Um, so, I mean, Comrade said the middlemen are responsible. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling us, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The middlemen are responsible for hoarding. Uh, right. So even where the production is taking place, it's even expensive. But well, Osage, one thing, one thing caught my attention, and it's the fact that these greedy um, um, middlemen might not necessarily be carrying out these actions without the motivation of what they've seen that's being done at the top. So it seems like there's a level of impunity that has indeed saturated the entire mindsets, the understanding of how things should be done, how businesses should be conducted, honesty no longer exists. I, I, I don't agree that that is the major reason uh, rice prices are, you know, that expensive. Um, it could be one of the, it could be one of the reasons. Maybe it's one, you know, maybe but one I don't of agree. The reasons. I don't agree that that's because what it is. It's, because it's, it's, it's a case of do as I do. In, yeah, but Don't you can't, you can't have, because there's a point in rice, there's, there's local rice being produced in different parts of the, of the country, and it's not the same, I don't be, I agree that it's the same middlemen that are handling the rice in Yola that are handling one in Ebony State, for example. Um, I don't agree with that. And if the rice is not cheaper in Ebony, and even in Yola where it is being produced, it's not cheaper. There's not one middleman that says, okay, I want to sell better, you know, because I mean, market prices always find a balance. Of course, market you know, and of course, with, mm -hmm. with, with, you know, an expanding market, there will be more people that would you know, reduce prices here and there, you know. And nobody's going to keep improving prices and keep putting themselves, you know, into more chaos because they're trying to make more money. Um, I, so I, I personally don't agree that that's what it is. It might be one of the factors, and I don't, I'm not disagreeing with him. It might be one of the factors that is leading to, you know, these prices being increased. But it's not, I don't think it's the main reason why, you know, um, uh, rice, uh, 70,000 naira for a bag of rice. I don't think that's what it is. 70,000 naira. It, it, it should be cheaper oh. somewhere if that's what, if, if that's, um, you know, what the situation Maybe was. Maybe when we find it where, where it's cheaper, then. Well, it's okay. not cheaper anyway. But anyway. Um, also on the Vanguard this morning, hardship, seven months, not enough to fix Nigeria. Nobody argues with that one. I think everybody should. Uh, we would, that, that is fact. The, the challenges that Nigeria has, mm -hmm. obviously, seven months is not enough. Two years, even, is not enough to fix Eight it. Years is not it enough. is not, definitely not enough. Nobody is expecting the government to fix Nigeria in seven months or in one year or in two years. What Nigerians want to see is deliberate efforts. Is Nigerians want to see efforts that are being put into place. And they agree with it that, okay, yes, these are things that are being done that will lead us in the right direction. Nobody is expecting magic. Um, but has the government done anything? Is the 2024 budget different from what it, what it looks like in 2023? Is there any move that government has made that gives Nigerians hope? The government that is currently in France? No. All right. This is all the time that we have for the newspapers this morning. We'd like to thank everybody who called from different parts of the country, even all the way in Yola. Uh, thanks for joining us and sharing your thoughts with us. We really appreciate it. Remember, it happens every morning at 8 a.m. Um, we, we look through the newspapers, and you can be a part of it. We'll take a short break. When we come back, we're expanding further on the conversations concerning BDCs, the CBN, and Nigeria's current economic challenges. Stay with us. Still on Breakfast Central this morning, Bureau of the Change Operators have uh, announced a shutdown of operations in Abuja, the federal capital territory, as a result of an unavailability, unavailability rather, of dollars. Uh, this was announced by the association's chairman, Abdullahi Daran, on uh, Wednesday, when the Naira closed at an all-time low of uh, 1,482 Naira against the U.S. dollar on the official window on Tuesday while the parallel market remained at a stable 1,450 naira to the dollar. Uh, this development is coming amid fresh moves by the Central Bank of Nigeria 
to stabilize the nation's volatile exchange rate with uh, Apex Bank ordering deposit money banks to sell their excess dollar stock by February 1st, 2024. I recall that Nigeria's uh, Senate had on Wednesday through its committee on banking, insurance and other uh, financial institutions uh, actually summoned the governor of uh, Central Bank of Nigeria, Olaya Mikadoso, to appear before it on Tuesday, the 6th of February, 2024, to answer questions on the state of the economy and the free fall of Naira in the Forex market. To further discuss this issue and highlight uh, what may come out of it is Naimek Albiariri. He is a political and, of course, a current affairs and not forget to an investment banker who has got years and years of dealing with, uh, uh, I'd say, uh, issues and situations like this, especially from Nigeria. Uh, let me start off first by saying welcome. It's good to see you in uh, February. Thank you very much. Happy New Month. All right. Um, what have you made of the entire uh, rigmarole, uh, back and forth, up and down currency uh, situation that we are facing at the moment? Um, it's very simple to understand. Um, I was just having a discussion with somebody this morning, and I pointed out where we are, where we are today. The currency, just like any commodity, the value of any local currency, just like any commodity, is driven by the law of demand and supply. If you have excess supply of the dollar into the Nigerian economy today, in which respect, compared to the demand, the Naira will gain massively over the dollar. I give you an example. Singapore, in 1965, was a barrier state kicked out of mainland Malaysia because it was just a strip of 750 square kilometer land. They even import sand. So this Malaysian mainland felt that they were useless and they kicked them out. Singapore was such a very useless and barrier state that they had a literacy level of almost about 57%. Nothing was looking right for them, but they had leadership that took them from third world country to first world country. If you look at Singaporean dollar from 1990 to 2024, you will observe something. As of 1990, the Singaporean dollar was $1.63 compared to US dollar. Today, it is $1.34 compared to one US dollar. The Singaporean dollar had gained 18% over the US dollar over the last um, 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 over 34 years, despite the fact that even last year they imported over 720 billion dollar worth of goods and commodities, they even import sand. The problem we have is that we are having illiquidity of the dollar. The liquidity of the dollar in the economy is so low, and I've always posited Nigeria is one country that can actually ramp up output and production of almost 300 billion dollars every year if only we can fix the constitutional, physical, and monetary policy framework of Nigeria to play a lot towards productivity. CBN actually did something very exciting over the last 48 hours. And I expected them to do what they've done, and they've done it. You know, I get angry when I see members of National Assembly inviting the Cardoso to come and they drill him. Cardoso is doing a marvelous work within his own sphere of influence. The problem we have in Nigeria are the physical managers. We are where we are today because MFN had printed 23 billion a trillion naira and handed over to Buhari. And then he used those monies. Let me tell you, without kidding you, I'm not this is a, a national TV. If an inquest is done into what Muhammad Buhari and those that worked with him did with 20, you discover that they actually used it to pursue the dollar. That is why we're see if you look at the import volume in Nigeria between 2015 to 2023, May 29 to be precise, go and look at the records. Nigeria did an total import of about $451 billion. Our total export proceed was about $406 billion. So we had a net negative portion of about 38 to $41 billion. But let me tell you something that will shock you. We borrowed $32 billion in external debt. It was $10 billion in 2020, 2015, and Boy left it at $43 billion. Now, between 2015 to 2023, we had $168 billion Diaspora remittances inflow into Nigeria. Buhari met foreign reserve of $59 billion. So net net, the dollar earnings we had in Nigeria in the last eight years was far more than the imports that we did. So why did we have erosion of the Naira from, from 199 to the 765? 
what the Tinubu government is facing today was is a result of the recklessness of the Buhari regime. And, and I, I find this so distasteful that Tinubu is still praising Buhari. Let me tell you, Obama Sanjong, when he became president in 1999, met a worse position. Reserve was $5 billion, incumbent to only about $1.6 billion. Net total debt was $32 billion on service level. Dollar oil was in at $17.34, and output was 1.6 million barriers. Papa Sanjo was in a very dire strait. He went to work. And within eight years, Papa Sanjo not only paid off the $32 billion debt to negotiations, he left a foreign reserve of about $47 billion. The economy grew by 6.5%. He left behind 4 million middle class population that earned between $40,000 to $170,000 in income. Opa Sanjo did the right thing. What he did, he went after the Apache family, negotiated with them to become part of the over $15 billion loot that they had. And it helped him to start life. And the whole world saw that he was very sincere. And they gave him debt forgiveness and helped him to stop. He set up EFCC, he set up ICPC. Opa Sanjo was a statesman that did well. Tinibu should follow the same timeline. We are where we are today because of the eight years' recklessness of the Buhari regime. Tinibu cannot be so still be parleying with Buhari. Let me tell you, a massive shake-up. It is estimated that over $75 billion were looted out of this economy by Buhari and those that worked with him. So Tinibu should sit down with them and negotiate. They should be the top part of the dollar that they took away from this economy. And that is why we are where we are. Now, let us review what the CBN has done. The bankers are also part of the problem. You discover last year, the five top big banks were reporting trillion naira profits. Yeah. Why was it so? They took a long net open position of buying up dollar, is anticipating that the naira would decrease so that they can sell and make profit, which is very, very this which is very, very sabotaging to our economy. The role of a commercial bank is financial intermediation, it's bringing together the surplus economic unit and deficit economic unit. Central deposit money banks are not supposed to take long open positions, buy dollar hedge over the naira, and then sell to make profit. It is criminal in the real sense of it. So what Cardoso have simply done is to say, tell them, no long open position, zero. Short open position, 20%. In fact, he should even make it 10%. Now, he has also removed the window on the IMTO, International Money Transfer Organizations. Now, before it used to be, you cannot sell your dollar import into Nigeria uh, um, above my, minus 2.5 plus 2.5% band within the prevailing former prevailing exchange rate the, the day before the day you sold. Now... People can now bring in their dollar and sell at whatever rate they want to sell. This is a willing buyer, willing seller market. Now, the next thing they should also do, export proceeds should also be liberalized in such a way that anybody who wants to export things should export it, bring in his dollar and sell at whatever they would be in Cuba in such a way that some of them now engage in criminal uh, arrangement of doing double yeah. um, invoices, which does not go well for the economy. It is, let me tell you, with what monetary policies are, the CBN has done, the next responsibility is for the physical side. And that is where the presidency and the EFCC comes into play. Right, we Barry. know there are three factors that drive exchange rate pressure in Nigeria. Corrupt short demand for the dollar is almost about 80%. The CBN and the EFCC should set up very strong forensic department desk. If, even if it means them recruiting consultants and deep experienced forensic investigators to work with them. Right, Mr. Mr. The that's why the governors have their pack and jack and where they can trace the monies. If we can stop the corruption demand for the money, dollar, we are the political bandits. Still, our it, naira. It, it sounds like a lot of work. Nigeria will get well. It sounds like a lot of work, Mr. Bieri. I, I also want to ask because we are almost out of time. I also want to ask um, for those who say that this is a temporary fix, that the, the CBN's order to banks, you know, to you know, dispose or to. to sell off all their dollars between now and, you know, uh, I think it was February 1st or 2nd, um, that there's only a temporary fix. The Naira would gain a little bit. And then after that, you know, we're going to go back to, of course, the free fall of the Naira again. Uh, do you agree that that's, you know, what yes. you know, it is? And then also, yeah, just to, just to add to this, I also want to know what should the CBN's goal be? Is it simply just reducing the free fall of the Naira? Or is that, should there be a target? that the CBN should be, you know, looking towards? Osage, even in a free market economy, I was also illustrated somebody, there's always intervention for the CBN. But the CBN can only intervene where they have surplus supply of the dollar. Let me give you an example. Between 19, 
1999, when Obasanjo Joe became president, it hit Naira to one dollar. To when he left, 124 Naira to one dollar. Naira lost only about 38 Naira in eight years. Jonathan 78, yeah, Dora Jonathan 78 Naira devaluation in eight years. Under Buhari, it was almost wide because of the arbitrary criminal regime that they created. The CBN is doing their best. I can tell you, I give Cardoso kudos. He's doing a great job. Now, like you rightly said, the intervention he has done will provide temporary reprieve. The next job is left for the physical managers, the presidency, the FC, even the National Assembly that is inviting him when they are part of the problem. They should try and ramp up the supply side. And to ramp up the supply side, we must um, we must in execute massive constitutional, physical, institutional reforms in such a way that we will stop the corruption demand on the dollar. That's number one. We must put in place measures to curb insecurity. You can see kidnapping everywhere. In the United States, monarchs are being kidnapped and murdered. That is not a good sign. The security architecture of Nigeria must be overhauled. See, people should go all the hog. Allow states to set up their own security arrangements, supervised by the federal government. Put the centralized security in the way it was between 1996. By doing this, if we can fix the insecurity, Nigerians can go to work be productive, and then on the, on, the, on, the, on the export window, we need to set up special terminals for exports at the seaport, at the airport, where people can produce and export. And we must set targets in, in these special terminals. If any goods get to those terminals and it is not exported within 12 hours, all the people will be sacked. See, Nigerians are not this. We can produce what we eat here. We can export even non-oil non -oil products that can give us revenues in over 100 to 200 million billion dollars. We can inflow remittances of not less than 50 billion dollars annually. But we must put in place the right constitutional, physical, and the, and the structural security arrangement that can enable Nigeria to be productive. That is not the job of Kadoso. Kadoso has done his own bit. Kudos to him. The next job is went for Buhari. It are disease governors, the municipal local government chairman, to fix the physical side. There are two sides of an economy, monetary and the physical. And also, it's doing right. a great job. They should All give right. they should protect our oil assets. If we are doing 2.5 million barrels of crude oil, we can get about 79 billion dollars annually, which is more than our annual import. Kadoso is not the one head of the oil, uh, oil export. Kadoso is doing his job. Tinibu and the rest of the governors should do their own job. Yeah. All right. Nameka, uh, very, um, as always, we really, really appreciate your clarity on these issues and for, of course, uh, spending your time with us, uh, breaking them down. We hope, of course, that CAD also gets it right. And, of course, you know, that the fiscal um, um, aspects of uh, monetary policy are also uh, fixed. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. We'll look forward to seeing you again. Have a great weekend ahead. Thank you, my brother. Well, don't forget that uh, the CBN governor will be uh, appearing before the Senate, uh, the House of Assembly. And um, definitely that will be next week. But prior to that, uh, we would see how far the dollar would go against the Naira and the likes. It's been a fruitful week uh, filled with a lot of activities, sad stories, kidnappings and the likes. We can only hope for the better. But stay with us here on Breakfast Central. We'll bring to you many more after. Fantastic being here. My name. And I'm Osaogi Ogbama. We'll see you again on Monday morning. Thanks to all the people who called into the show this week also. We appreciate it. Um, and of course, to those who are on our social media platforms also totally appreciate it. See you again on Monday. Have a great weekend. Bye for now.